It's 1942 and a Russian warplane flies through a panoply of German bullets, trying to prevent it reaching Leningrad. The city is under siege from Hitler's army, a siege that will endure for 900 days and consume over a million lives. The plane's cargo consists of urgently needed medical supplies, plus a unique item, a conductor's score for Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, known today as the Leningrad. The year 1942, at the very heart of the Second World War. Russian Leningrad, formerly and currently known as St. Petersburg, lay besieged on all sides by German forces. The fabled Leningrad Symphony Orchestra had already been evacuated from the city, so the only band left in town, the radio orchestra, was left to perform Shostakovich's later symphony, and they only had 15 players. Other musicians had to be released from the trenches. The musicians were all given extra rations. It was vitally important for the Russian authorities to maintain an attitude of life as normal, to project an image of strength and resistance to the world. Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony had been formally conscripted as part of that fight. For the premiere in the besieged city on the 13th of August 1942, the concert hall was packed. Posters everywhere advertised the event and speakers were set up throughout the city, even out towards the German besieging troops to broadcast the work. There was also a massive 3,000 shell artillery bombardment of German positions before the concert to ensure the enemy's silence for the performance. The premiere was electric. The playwright Alexandra Kron said, people who no longer knew how to shed tears of sorrow and misery now cried from sheer joy. The writer, Alexei Tolstoy, typified the Russian response. The Seventh Symphony arose from the conscience of the Russian people who unwaveringly accepted mortal combat with evil forces. The symphony was performed first all over Russia and then the world. In America, the world's two greatest conductors, Furt Wangler and Toscanini, fought for baton privilege for the American premiere. Toscanini, with his strong anti-fascist reputation, won that particular battle and the American premiere was broadcast worldwide to millions. The week after the Leningrad premiere, Shostakovich himself appeared on the cover of Time magazine. His seventh symphony, the Leningrad, had become the most discussed piece of music in the world. And its message was clear. The Soviet Union was an active protector of European culture against German Nazism. And America and its allies stood firmly beside their Soviet partners. The siege is finally lifted, and just over a year later, in 1945, as Allied armies swarm into Germany, the Nazi regime is finally defeated. Cue victorious outro music and a like and subscribe request. Only, things aren't quite so simple. You see, the Nazis may not have been the first to invade Russia. There's a clue from the composer himself, who had been evacuated from Leningrad to Kubyshev, from where he said in 1942, Music, real music, can never be literally tied to a theme. Nazism is not the only form of fascism. This music is about all forms of terror, slavery and the bondage of the spirit. Shostakovich may well have been aiming his musical weaponry at Stalinism and not just Nazism. The idea was that Russia had been invaded twice, the second time by Nazis, but the first by Stalinist communism. This alternative narrative became explicit with the publication in 1979, four years after Shostakovich's death, of supposed interviews with the composer by the writer Solomon Volkov in his controversial book Testimony. Here, Shostakovich is reported to have said, Naturally fascism is repugnant to me, but not only German fascism, any form is repugnant. I suffer for everyone who was tortured, shot or starved to death. There were millions of them in the country before the war with Hitler even began. Doubt was also cast that the symphony was even written during the war. The first movement in particular was almost certainly conceived before Hitler's 1941 invasion. However, here the whole situation becomes murky as Volkov has been accused of making up his text. Now, academic disputes can be nasty fights and this one has been particularly vicious 
So let's just sidestep the critics for a moment and try listening to the music itself. What does the music have to say? The final movement has always sounded to me like a Russian response to Nazism. There's a slow, grinding, but ultimately victorious closure to the symphony that seems to say, no matter what the opposition, Russia has the will and the numbers to ensure an ultimate hard-won victory. this spirit of dogged resistance that must have electrified most of Russia and indeed the world. However, when I listen to the first movement, I hear something different. It's the snare drum in about seven minutes in that appears to ring the changes. It begins a series of marches that repeat 12 times escalating each time in a maleficent glee. This is like a demented version of the Bolero. Each time we circle round again, we seem to dive deeper into an evil that swoops everywhere around us. I'm sorry, but this serpentine evil sounds far more like Stalinism than Nazism. This is an evil that comes from within, with a smiling face, before taking over the whole movement in loud, brash militarism. It doesn't sound like an invasion from outside, it sounds like one that grows from inside. Now, of course, two things can be right at the same time. This music can be about Nazism and can also be about Stalinism. Music is abstract. It suggests rather than defines. Just as Shostakovich himself said, that's one of the reasons music can be both so effective and at the same time so tricky to define. But whichever way you look at it, Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony clearly stands as a musical monument against militarism. And it reminds us that when a fascist autocracy first appears in a country, it comes with a smiling face. The deaths come later. Please like and subscribe.